A lot of people describe themselves as inveterate list makers, and I certainly am one, but I think I didn't realize there was a book in it until someone suggested that I write a book about it, to which my first response was to laugh. And then I thought, yeah, there are things to say about this practice of list making and why I find it so helpful in a number of ways. One way it's helpful is to, obviously, to organize your thoughts. I believe in lists more than I believe in outlines. I've spent a lot of years teaching English, and one of the first things I do is say, let's just not do outlines. Let's just do a list of if you had three things you really want someone to get about what you have learned, what would they be? If you had five things, what would those be? If you had seven things, what would those be? And then once you have a list, you start messing around with it and moving things around and seeing how they relate to each other, but it's an open space. And so lists don't have that closed sense that I get from outlines, which is this has to come after this. You kind of prioritize things at the beginning. So the way lists open up space is one thing. The way one thing leads to another is another thing. When you start a list, especially if you have a title, and I really believe that the title you get gives you energy. If you say, as I did on my 50th birthday, I wrote this list, what's fun after 50? And then I started writing a list of things I thought would be fun after 50, and how fun shifts. But the title itself invites a certain reflection on what has changed. What's fun now? What well, used to be fun, but it's really not that fun anymore. Could I just admit that I don't want to ride a roller coaster ever again before I die? Um, but there are some new things that are fun as you change your orientation and slow down and move into different chapters of relationship. So that's helpful. And then I have found also that lists um, can pave the way for a certain kind of prayer. I, I grew up in a Baptist kind of tradition where there was lots of spontaneous prayer. So I never heard of litanies until I was an older adolescent. But I love them. I love the long repetition of the litany kinds of prayers where you just stay with, stay with, stay with, stay with. And the rhythm of the petition and the address to God going back and forth ha is a poetic device. And litanies can be constructed in some interesting ways where you have a primary petition, you have some specific requests, and then you address God. But I think that staying with is one of the things a list can help you do. We're not done yet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna list things for five whole minutes. Or I'm gonna say 15 things that do X, you know, 15 reasons to ride your bicycle, or um, 10 good things about spending time with a toddler, or um, five things marriage teaches. But however big the list is, it gives you space. So it's like the lines around a tennis court. I don't know if I thought of it as my thing until pretty recently when I began to publish lists as postcards. Um, and I've always used them in classes, you know, just partly to uh, help people not be afraid of the project in front of them. Like I just asked people at the beginning of a big research paper, just make a list of 10 things you already have to say about this or make a list of 15 questions you'd really like to answer, or things you'd really like to know. You know, but just play with this. Let it open up. Let the list show you something about your own curiosities or about possibilities. And that the idea that a list can show you something I think is important, because in my experience, once you start putting down obvious things, the not so obvious things come up. And almost every time I make a list, I surprise myself. Or something quirky and funny will occur to you even in the middle of making serious, putting down serious items on the list. And so you begin to experience the, t the tonality of your own thoughts, that even in the space of something serious, there is room for a little humor 
or if you start out to make a light-hearted list, you might also find yourself dropping into deeper reflection about what you're putting down. And I've also found that lists are gifts for people. I think a lovely birthday gift, and I would recommend this to anyone, is to just list 10 things I've noticed about you this year. It's such a sweet way of evading the Hallmark card and um, really attending to someone you love and saying, I've noticed some shifts and some changes. But it is also a way of making yourself aware of what you see, what you know, what you wish for. I think a list of things I want might seem like a very simple-minded thing to do, but wants keep changing. Things I want now is a pretty interesting list because they're not the things, same things I wanted last year or even necessarily last week. So it's a way of tracking your own changes and shifts and currents in your self-awareness. So lists are mirrors. I love quoting, I think it was Ian Forster who said, how, how can I know what I think till I see what I say? So as I've said, when you begin to write a list, you begin to notice things. I had three directions I used to give students in my English courses. One was just as you read, just notice, just practice noticing things. Notice verbs, notice images, notice rhythms. Notice metaphors, that's instruction number one. Number two is notice what you noticed. So begin to notice patterns in the things that you noticed. And the third is notice that you noticed what you noticed. <laughs> and that's where we get to this self-awareness. I notice that I'm a person who really gravitates to verbs. It is the heart of the sentence. I think verbs matter a lot, and I think that they get buried or thrown away. But verbs are, call our attention to process. And we live in a culture that's so oriented toward product rather than process, um, that I think to, to notice verbs is a way of staying focused on what actually happened here. And can I, as a writer, find a verb that really articulates what happened. It's a kind of responsibility more people should be attending to. Um, so I think that a list is a way of pausing and noticing and then noticing a little more and noticing that you just did that. You just said that last thing and that brought up something else. So allowing yourself to notice what you put down in the previous line is the way I write anyway, but I think it happens very quickly in lists. I have a, a kind of list I've given to a few friends who are celebrating anniversaries, for instance. And it calls my attention to their marriage as I think about what I notice about you two and your marriage. But it also makes me reflect on my own marriage and how when I look at someone else's marriage, then I think about my marriage. So that's another way in which lists become mirrors. I find out things about myself when I write them. I did one a while back called a manifesto for amateurs. And I thought about all the things I, I like to do but don't do very well. There are some things I do very well and I'm skilled at them and I've done them a long time, but there are a lot of other things I don't do very well. And I love Chesterton saying that if a, if a thing's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. So that's something particularly to claim in the last half of life when you're not going to go to Carnegie Hall or Wimbledon, but you would like to play the flute or tennis. And it's okay to do it badly. So um, the Manifesto for Amateurs was a way of articulating the permission I want to give myself. Like, it's okay to do it badly. You don't have to measure everything. Um, if you only have a half an hour, give it the half hour and enjoy it, that kind of thing. So lots of permission. That really helped me to pick up the flute and play it badly now and then and love the sound of the flute. <laughs> Probably most of them had an, their origins in a list. Certainly caring for words in a culture of lies 
was a list of strategies of stewardship, as I called it. And actually, when I delivered those lectures at Princeton Seminary, um, I handed out, this was such a girly thing to do, really, but I handed out little bookmarks with the 12 strategies on them. Love words, tell the truth, don't tolerate lies, read well, practice poetry, and so on. That was the table of contents. But it did start with my asking myself, what would it take to be a really good steward of the language that we have in common as a gift that's been given to us to care for? It was fun to think about it that way. And similarly, yeah, I think that um, what's in a phrase was just a list of favorite phrases from scripture. And um, the two books about death and dying, they came out of my experiences with family members who died and also as a hospice volunteer. But certainly they came initially from just listing moments, moments that I recalled that I thought were important to lift up as distinctive features of that chapter of life when you're when you're aware that you're dying or someone you love is dying. So I guess it's a habit of mind. But the nice thing about lists, again, as opposed to outlines, is once you have it, then you begin moving things around and new relationships among those things emerge and order presents itself. But I vigorously believe that you shouldn't be too quick to impose an order on anything you write because there's some way of just allowing and permitting the spirit to work with you as you write that can be experienced in a rather immediate way when all you're writing is a list. If you're trying to construct a paragraph, there's something a little more sophisticated or complicated going on, but a list is so free that it frees you up to allow. I think there's a, uh, a lot of people are speaking these days about spiritual practices. I think it's a word that Protestants have retrieved from the Catholic world, or maybe Christians have retrieved from the Buddhist world. Many of my friends in Berkeley talk about their Buddhist practices. But I think a list as a practice, which that word is in the subtitle, gives it a kind of dignity that this is something, this isn't just a little kind of trivial thing I do in between things like doodling, which can also lead to deeper things. But it could be a practice that every day I'm just going to write a list. I'm going to take five minutes and just list and see what comes. The see what comes part is where I think it's pretty easy to drop into a deeper place of openness to being addressed and letting the Spirit speak. That's where the real value is. What I hope people come away with after reading this book is an inclination to write lists and see what happens and a sense that if you want to write but a journal for instance if you don't think you have time you do have time to do this so it makes a little space for writing in people's lives and I believe that writing is healing I think that writing is a way of staying in touch with words and language and self um, I'm very logocentric I love the prologue to the Gospel of John. I do believe that to say in the beginning was the Word is a mysterious way of speaking about God, but it's also, it links divine energy to language, which the Hebrews certainly did. And so to say when you have, when you utter a word or when you inscribe a word, you're actually summoning a kind of energy around it and that words have energy fields. I believe that. I get really mystical about this. So I would hope that people would give themselves permission to be both deeply attentive and playful with language, because language is really suffering from a very depleted public discourse. But we can keep language alive and fresh if we use it every, every day in a thoughtful way. And writing is a way of slowing down and looking at words instead of just barging through them.